Hi, everyone. Welcome to Charm City, settings that transport the reader. We are members of Paper Lantern Writers, um, the three of us, the three of five. We're pretty excited to share with you some uh, settings that transport the reader, not only from our own books, but from other historical fiction that we are big fans of. It won't move. <laughs> Uh-oh, we're having to we go. There we go. So here we are. This is all of us uh, Paper Lantern writers. We are a historical fiction authors collective. So thank you uh, to Margaret and Elle for including us in Yola Book of Blood PDX. It's pretty exciting. It's been fun to prepare for you today. And thank you to everyone tuning in with us. Uh, so to get things kicked off, I'm going to just let you know that I am EDK. I am a historical... Oh, I guess CV is going to go first. <laughs> Hi, I'm C.B. Lee, and I write historical family saga, and the work that I'm working on is set in the Isle of Jersey during the 15th century. It's called Roses and Rebels, and I hope to have a publication date for that next year. And when I'm not writing, I am a loan officer by day and a substitute teacher. There I am, EDK. So I am a historical romance author. I write Regency romance, which is uh, basically 1815 to 1820 for me. Uh, my first book, A Lady's Revenge, came out this year in 2020, which was a bit of a hard year. Um, and it won the 2020 Gold Leaf uh, best first book, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And my second book is The Box from the Blacksmith, which will be coming out in February. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I'm also a historical fiction reviewer. So I have review for the Historical Novel Society. I'm also a member of the Romance Writers of America and the Alliance of Independent Authors. And my day job is a healthcare professional. And I'm Anna Brazel, and my last name rhymes with Razzle or Dazzle. I write historical crime fiction uh, based on, uh, based in, set in America's Gilded Age through World War I. I have one novel out, it's Fanny Newcomb and the Irish Channel Ripper, which takes place in 1889, New Orleans, Louisiana. And it's a book that in 2018 won the Independent Book Publishers Association Gold for historical fiction. I also write short stories featuring bodacious American women heroines like Kate Chopin, the author of the controversial 1899 novel, The Awakening, or um, and Evelyn Nesbitt, the abused showgirl who was the chief witness at the 20th century's trial of the century. I'm a member of Sisters in Crime and the Historical Novel Society, two great organizations I can really recommend for both readers and writers. I have a master's degree in history, American history, and I worked as both a historian and an architectural historian. I'm retired from a career as an information developer in the software industry, and now I get to write historical fiction full time. Woohoo. Next slide, please. But before I got to write historical fiction full time, I got to read lots of historical and other type of fiction in my free time. And CV, Edie and I are all great readers of historical fiction, great lovers of earlier times and places. And today we wanted to share our love of settings with you, primarily as reader to reader, but also a little bit as writer to reader. All right. So to set the scene for our talk, let's take a quick peek at the three pillars, the strong foundation needed for any story, whether your story is historical fiction or sci-fi or thriller or literary fiction or even good nonfiction. You need characters, typically people or animals. You need a plot, the interrelated sequences of events, and you need a setting in the simplest terms actually from the OED, a time and a place. But setting goes much deeper than a mere time and place, as we all know, and it should enrich, intrigue, and bring depth to the story in many different ways. I'd also say that the best written settings absolutely delight the reader. All right, Edie. So before we get too deep into this, I do want to mention that we have some giveaways happening. Uh, for this panel, which we just 
got so excited about we we forgot. Uh, so I'm going to be giving away a copy of uh, an e copy of A Lady's Revenge. So if you want to drop something in the comments and let me know if there was something that you were too scared to try but you've always wanted to do and just let me know what that is. You will see later in the presentation how come I'm asking that particular question. And Anna, did you have one that you wanted to give away too? I do. I have a paperback of Fanny Newcomb. And my question, oh, I think it is something about what's your favorite location in New Orleans? Where do you like, what, what do you like in New Orleans? Whether you've been there or not, where would you like to go in New Orleans? Hmm. I want to go to a place that has beignets. Come on, <laughs> yes. All right, to get back to the, the settings at hand here. So we have setting elements that transport the readers. So how do we do that? We uh, need to use our five senses. So what you see, what you feel, what you hear, what you touch, what you taste, as in beignets. Uh, the time, right? So the year, the month, the day, the minute. And grounding in time helps with reader expectation. Do we know that there is a new moon and how much light to expect in the darkness? Are there candles or firelight or gas lamps or electricity? Your locale is obviously important. If you were talking about science fiction, then maybe you were talking about which planet we're in or uh, which country, which city, which room in a house. Our way of life, clothing, transportation, food, and food. Food tells so many stories and can be such a potential trip up in historical fiction. Do old world denizens have access to new world foods like potatoes? Has chocolate been introduced yet? Those kinds of things. A physical temperature, of course, is also important. You're hot, you're cold, you're clear, you're cloudy, you're snowy. And how do people keep warm or cool in those places? Because that is our technology level. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, I feel the same way. Uh, I have a toddler who's very into the moon right now. So oof, we have a lot of conversations. Um, and of course, the emotional temp, the political climate, the economic status, your, your religious and cultural mores. This is a way that will help readers figure out how characters are going to react to the conflicts that will arise. Next slide. So as readers, we seek both the unique and the universal. So when describing a setting, we seek to provide enough information about the environment around the characters to pull you in and experience their world for yourself, you know, to whisk you away on a journey to a land far, far away. And the use of setting enhances and enriches the experience, amplifying emotions such as using rain or a dark sky when the character is sad and sun when a character is happy, red roses to show love, that kind of thing. How a character interacts with the world around them can give us an insight into who they are as a person. Time period will make a difference in goals and how they react to a situation. Does a boy wanna grow up to be a knight or does he wanna grow up to be a computer programmer? And we can use for setting to foreshadow things to come. The inclusion of a similar event or the placement of an object that repeats or returns, like Chekhov's dramatic principle, one must never place a loaded rifle on the stage if it isn't going to go off. It's wrong to make promises you don't mean to keep, which is also something good in real life. And settings can amplify the resolution of a conflict, allowing readers to relax and experience a return to a sense of normalcy. So in my novel, I use expectations of modern readers to turn the world on its head. So in A Lady's Revenge, set in England in 1817, Lady Lydia is an Earl's daughter who learns to box. Yeah, you heard that right. So boxing was the sport of the time, and there is historical evidence that women participated in it. Would an Earl's daughter do it? Uh, maybe, if she had enough reason to do so. And the hero in my novel is a professional boxer turned stockbroker. He has new money and is also based on a real life person who was a boxer, made a bunch of money, and eventually married up and became an MP. So the precedence was there in history, but it isn't a story that modern readers would have heard before. So I give the settings a reader would expect in a Regency romance to deliver a story that is new. So in a nutshell, this is how a writer can take a common storyline and mold it into something new using world building to tell a story that can only happen in that specific time and specific place. There are many resources an author can utilize for constructing a realistic world. And after my research, 
from books and online, I decided that I needed to take a location tour. Part of the interesting things that I needed to find out had to do with topography. So I wanted to go there and see the geography. For me, I wanted to relive as much as I could what happened to my characters. I wanted to walk where they walked and see what they saw and to get a feel of what life was like during the medieval era. And that I was actually very lucky because the countryside in Jersey has changed very little since medieval days. And now I'm going to take you to one of the locations that's featured in my work in progress. So this is a picture of Mount Orgai, a castle that's about 800 years old, and it was once the center of power on the island of Jersey. Castles were strategically located for ease of defense. And before airplanes, this particular castle was only defeated through the use of a siege. As you can see, the terrain is quite steep from land and from sea, which made it very easy to defend. This here is a picture of the Great Hall with its whitewashed walls and its natural light. And this is where the rulers and the soldiers would have dined and entertained important guests. I imagine within these walls that there was a lot of laughter and important negotiations and definitely an abundance of food. While down below lay the dungeon where prisoners were chained and served meager portions. And the really dangerous criminals were put in the windowless dungeon. Both the Great Hall and both the dungeons are featured in my book. And because of my trip, I feel that I was better equipped to tell, take my readers there because I had been there. And I have a lot of other pictures from my trip that are on my website. So if you want to go look at more pictures of Jersey, which is a beautiful, absolutely stunning island, you can go to my website at CV Lee and I have a travel log there. So uh, I have been to London, uh, but that was actually not how I decided to draw my world together. Um, because realizing early on when I was reading uh, that my family is not from aristocrats and would likely not live in a castle or while reading Jane Austen would not have lived in Mayfair. So being a student of history, uh, I found that many women had been running their own households single-handedly for a very long time, whether their husbands had died or run off or were in a war they had to make do, whether that was milking the cows or running a business, they would have gotten their hands dirty. And these women make up the bulk of the population, population <clears throat> and have no time for impractical worries. And I wanted to tell their stories and give them a happily ever after. So when I did some digging, I found that the best boxer of the 18th century was in fact a woman, Elizabeth Wilkinson Stokes. She was considered the invincible city championess and fought with weapons as well as her fists. And in the 19th century, society conspired to erase her and replace her with a male contemporary, James Figg. So you can see in these slides right here, we have the female bruisers. Bruisers, of course, was an early term for boxers. Uh, and then next to it is a poster uh, for James Figg. And James Figg happened to be friends with the artist William Hogarth, whose etchings and paintings I've relied on pretty heavily for my, you know, quote unquote, lower class books here. And this is one of the posters that Hogarth did for James Figg. And also to note, James Figg was never called a champion on his own, in his own time. Uh, Elizabeth Wilkinson Stokes, however, was, even though there was no set way to evaluate a champion. So I used artwork like this to help me construct an accurate world where the 99% lived. It was crowded and noisy and smelly and funny and rowdy. And there were street vendors and fairs and traditions that upper class women would not have been allowed to participate in. And after diving in, I would rather be in the 99% than in Mayfair with the silk slippers. And I will note that in my quest for research, I did take up boxing for about two years, just so I could see how it felt in my own body to throw a punch and how to 
take a punch as well. But I was very nervous about going in. I was in my middle 30s uh, and I was the oldest person in the room. <laughs> so this uh, goes into my giveaway. So if there was ever anything that you were scared to try, but you always wanted to do, I hear ya. <laughs> Next slide. So there is a little bit of resistance to this view of history as being lusty and crowded and indecorous. And you can see here in these two satirical works by William Hogarth, that there was more to these people whose symmet symmetrical architecture and novels of manners that have endured. And in fact, these facades were reinforced by the Victorians and replaced the actual historical facts, which is a tribute to the power of fiction. And seeing these satires by contemporary artists can show us what really happened in the streets of London and beyond. My second book, which will be out in February, The Boxer and the Blacksmith, exists in this kind of street life. My main character, Bess Abbott, is inspired by that famous female boxer, Elizabeth Wilkinson Stokes. And my Bess is also a professional boxer. So I needed the smells and the sights of a crowded, illegal arena, something that could have only happened then as England yeah. Women's boxing in 1880. So, <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Next slide. Next slide. So, uh, my story, Fanny Newcomb and the Irish Channel Ripper, is set in the Irish immigrant neighborhood, the slums of 1889 New Orleans a time when New Orleans had a quarter of a million citizens, a massive city debt, uh, which meant very poor citizens. And in my story, it has a Jack the Ripper copycat who preys on those poor women. But fortunately for the real 1889 New Orleans and my novel, the city also had a new group of educated middle and upper class women who were prepared to roll up their sleeves to help their poorer neighbors. So I was drawn to write about New Orleans in 1889 because of the intersection of the big bad city setting and these optimistic, hardworking new women of almost turn of the century. And also because um, there are very few books written about this period in New Orleans, although there are a lot of books written about Gilded Age New York and Boston and Chicago, New Orleans was almost a virgin setting which meant that I got to build the world all by myself. And like CV, um, visiting Jersey, I've had many locations, trips to New Orleans, many of them with a drink in my hand for in the, in the afternoons and evenings, of course. And I also lived in New Orleans the summer I researched for my master's thesis. So while I was in New Orleans, I've seen many places that haven't changed much since 1889. So that was really valuable for me. And after lots of searching, I also found lots of books with lots of photos and descriptions. Um, so I used everything from books like Lost New Orleans, which shows photos of buildings and, and people who are no longer there, to the streetcar guides, to tourist guides, and even cookbooks to um, understand how the city was put together. And in the next slide, uh, one of my favorite ways of researching any city of the turn of the century is through postcards. And most of you know that postcards were created in the late 19th century, and they quickly became a popular way for people to communicate with each other. I've collected about 100 different views of New Orleans. And when I look closely, almost every one of these cards offers a detail that I can use to set my scene. And these are some of the photos that I've actually used to um, get some of my settings from. Also, in the next slide, Sanborn maps, and uh, this is kind of a little secret. They are another great research advantage when you're building a world in um, America. Basically, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company has maps of almost every American city from about 1866 to 1960. And these maps will show you whether the buildings were made of brick or frame or rock, how many stories they had, what kind of businesses were inside, which is really, really useful. And then some some maps um, provide interior floor plans, like the map at the bottom in the right, right corner, which shows the Hotel Royale. So the, the characters in Fanny Newcomb probably visit 
20 to 30 different locations, different settings. And I use these maps to understand where all of these locations were set in their relationship to each other and who lived where in this uh, changing city. And the maps go down to microscopic detail in the city. And even though most of the info I gleaned never made it into the novel, as I built my world, it helped me understand what I was doing. And I'm hoping that that my research here makes the book more, um, more real and accurate for readers. Okay, next slide. So settings are more than a time and a place. There is a great deal of work that a setting can do. And as a reader, when you become aware of that extra heavy lifting that's happening behind the scenes, it can enhance your own immersion and experience of a book. So we are going to give you a few examples to help you out. So historical fiction is necessarily weighted on setting, but each historical subgenre also has some common settings that will help draw the world. In a subgenre like CV's Family Saga, setting is the natural environment for the clan. It shows permanence and familial goals through the use of uh, the family estate. And then the family hierarchy, the holy days that the family observes. And if it's set when CV's work is, then you have its castle. For me, in romance, the setting should help along the love story, becoming the author's wingman and drawing two characters or more depends on what kind of romance you're writing, uh, drawing those people together. So some of those common places include the country party, where the rules are relaxed and the chaperones are distracted, the gaming hell slash the club, where men gather to discuss women, lay bets, and engage in behavior that women may find wicked, yet interesting. The ball is a glittering party and display of wealth, where the characters are dressed to impress and feel either very special or very invisible. And of course, for Regencies, there is London, or town, as it is referred to in Jane Austen. London is the seat of power, money, and where characters must be on their best behavior, otherwise the consequences will be dire. In Mysteries, settings act as a magnifying glass in a Sherlock Holmesian kind of sense. Mystery also has a country house, but put to different uses than in romance. And of course, the police station and jail to show consequences or find criminals with information the society event where a crowd comes together for enjoyment but ends poorly. And of course, in many mysteries, you have the big bad city fraught with crime alleyways. So next, there we go. So just to demonstrate setting, we're gonna do some readings. And for my first selection, it comes from the novel Miracle at St. Bruno's by Philippa Carr. And here we get a description of the grounds around the big house. But after Kate came, all the little pleasures seemed to be slightly less exciting. Romping with the dogs, feeding the peacocks, and gathering flowers for my mother and seeing how many different kinds I could find and name. All that was childish. Kate liked dressing up, pretending she was someone else, climbing the trees in the nuttery, hiding there and throwing nuts down on the people as they passed. And from this excerpt, you get not only a visual of the estate itself, but the author uses the setting to provide insight into Kate's character as a fun-loving prankster. All right, I'm going to share with you uh, from my book, A Lady's Revenge. So we are gonna explore the country house party and I'm gonna read a little bit longer here so you can see how I'm using setting to um, draw two characters together. The morning had been dreary. Rain clattered on the windows. Lydia excused herself to go down to the drawing room in search of other entertainment besides Charlotte reading aloud and Agnes's embroidery. The room was stuffy with heat and stillness while outside the rain continued heedless. And Lydia meant to go to the drawing room. She meant to find the other young ladies in a card game or charades or something to do that was suitable. But on her way there, she realized it might be interesting to see how the orangery was set up. Since the exhibition was to be held the night after dinner, would there be a ring marked out? Or would it be more like the stage shows they held at Drury Lane where James had taken her to see Molyneux before he retired? Molyneux's a boxer. When she entered, she found chairs lined up in one half of the room and an undressed Mr. Arthur in the other. There were only a few candles lit, and while an orangery ought to be bright with all the windows, the rain kept the light muted. 
He shadow boxed and the candles traced his hard lines. Each hard jab threw sweat into the air, which made it look as if he radiated light. It fairly stopped her heart. Maybe it wouldn't matter to him that she was broken. Perhaps a man like him, a man of hardship and gain, he could see past such ruin. The attention he gave to his sister was admirable and his friendship with Bess, a lifelong friendship with a woman. He was a different sort of man, respectful, even if he wasn't truly respectable in the social sense. But she preferred the former over the latter anyhow, and she moved through the chairs, unable to keep her eyes off of him. Her dress caught a chair and the legs dragged against the wood floor, causing Mr. Arthur to look up from his exercise. There's sexy times ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, all right, let's calm down a little. <laughs> <laughs> While in most romances, the house, a big house, whether in town or country, is elegantly designed for seduction. In mysteries, the house is often an unkept, unhappy place. The house represents the owner who lives there, and if the, own, if the house is moody and bereft, the owner, very often our hero or our heroine, will be equally moody and bereft. In mysteries, the house is both setting and character. This is from Jane Jakeman's Let There Be Blood, one of my favorite descriptions. I walk through my mansion at Malfine, through room after darkened room, and judge whether it is suitable for a polite gathering of local society. The reception rooms, the ballroom, the dining rooms, the grand suites and bedrooms, the endless hutches for maids up in the attics of the house where dust, the beggar's velvet, drifts across the floor. All is deserted. The moonlight is falling through the chinks in the shutters, touching on faded marble and gilded cornices, on inlaid chests and brass-bound cabinets, glistening on the pendant milky drops of cobweb-bound chandeliers. Brocade and velvet curtains hang at the windows, all torn and rotting. There's gonna be a mystery here. I love that beggar's velvet. Beggar's velvet. It's so good. Evie. Mm, yes, sorry, I got distracted by Beggar's Velvet. So next in our lists, uh, we're gonna compare notes on Family Saga's hierarchy and the mysteries police station and jail settings. All right, for this reading, I am going from The King's Concubine and here Anne O'Brien tells the fictionalized story of a girl named Alice Perez a girl of unknown parentage brought to the palace by Edward III as a, waiting, a, a lady in waiting for his queen. She soon becomes the king's mistress and rises to power behind the throne and it becomes one of the richest women in England. And this is a true person. So the combination of expert, excerpts that I'm going to read um, are about the first day that she comes to the castle. I found myself on the threshold of a large sun-filled room, so full of color and activity and soft chatter, a feminine glamour that it took my breath, more than even the grandeur of the great hall, the sheer vibrancy of it. Here was every hue and tint I could imagine, overlapping, entirely pleasing to the eye, creating butterflies of the women who filled the room. Here was a whole world of which I had no knowledge, to enchant ear and eye, the steward bowed himself out and took me with him, the door closing on that magical scene in the solar. I had not managed to step beyond the threshold and I was shaken by a sudden desire to do so, to be part of the life that went on behind that closed door. The kitchen was awash with activity. On all sides, scullions, spit boys, pot boys, bottle washers applied themselves with a racket as if all hell had broken loose. The heat was overpowering from the ovens and the open fire. I was now the owner of a straw pallet in a cramped attic room with two of the maids. I was given a blanket, a new shift and kirtle, new to me at any event, a length of cloth to wrap round my hair, and a pair of rough shoes. So these settings depict the sharp contrast that is between what we now often call the upstairs and downstairs, the difference between the life of royalty and servants and demonstrating the hierarchy. Um, so 
the, the police off the police station, the jail, the hospital, and the parish prison. So in historical crime fiction, when you have a professional detective or an amateur sleuth like my Fanny Newcomb, you'll usually have a scene set in one of those places. Here's my scene, part of my scene from the parish prison. And as I was writing these scenes, I had two sources of setting inspiration. One, the drawing of the massive prison, and then the Sanborn map of the layout, which um, I didn't really use, but it was interesting to me when I was putting this together. So this is from my novel. The protectors of the parish prison, the 20 or so patrolmen who lined up against the facade of the imposing brick fortress had their club wielding hands full. Lawrence waited for Fanny and Sylvia in front of the prison and led the women into a small windowless room. It had a regular wooden door so Fanny knew it was not a cell, but it was so small and airless that she felt imprisoned. Within minutes, the door opened and Carl was brought inside, seated and shackled to the table. Two beefy guards positioned themselves behind him. Lawrence coughed gruffly and the guards left the room. Be quick about this, he told Fanny. All right, next slide. Okay, so um, now we are gonna compare the family saga parties, which are the holy days, um, which is the etymology and the English word holiday, actually. And in the Regency romance world, we have the ball. So for this, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from the novel that I'm writing, Roses and Rebels. And time then was marked between just every day and holy days. And holy days were a time of red celebration, particularly with Easter and Christmas, since they followed Advent and Lent, which were times of prayer and penance and self-denial, which basically is fasting and abstinence. And this scene, I am visualizing the Christmas Eve feast. The room sparkled with the light of hundreds of flickering candles in large silver candlesticks. A white damask tablecloth covered the Lord's trussle table garnished with holly, ivy, mistletoe, and pewter flagons filled with spiced wine. Philippe and his mother stepped up onto the dais and took their places in front of the fire. Flames licked around the yule log, providing welcome warmth. Carvers paraded in carrying platters of pheasant, fish, and the traditional roasted yule boar, an apple stuffed in its mouth. Spoons clanked against platters as pages filled trenchers and placed them on the tables. Minstrels strumming psalteries sang Christmas carols while mummers and jugglers strolled about the room entertaining the diners. Noisy chatter and laughter drew Philippe's attention to the table filled with children. They dug greedily into their meal and shared an easy camaraderie. Their faces radiated joy while he, the heir of the manor, sat miserable and alone. He longed to join them, but such behavior would be frowned upon. Philippe picked up the diamond-shaped gingerbread and pulled out the cloves securing the tiny holly leaf. In years past, he'd spent hours in the kitchen helping the bakers stir breadcrumbs into the spicy honey and molding the dough into shapes like stars and crescent moons. But at 10, he was too old for such childish pursuits. And so here I tried to draw the picture not only of what the feasting would be like, but also to illustrate the hierarchy within the estate and also to let you know how early childhood ended back in that time period. Mm -hmm. All right, so I chose The Duke I Tempted by Scarlett Peckham because this entire novel rests on its ball. The novel is about Poppy, who is an exotic gardener importing plants from the colonies because it is 1753. She's chosen by the Duke's sister to create an unusual and spectacular party for the aristocratic set from London. So the ball for her is not just a place to be seen as beautiful or a debut in high society, but it's also the culmination of her life's work and a precipice for launching a new business that would give her financial stability, as well as this whole one event is also cementing the knowledge that though she is attracted to the Duke, they are ill-fitted, that they can't be together. It had taken all night, but every last garland was hung, 
Every last sculpture was mounted. Every last blossom was in its rightful place. The house smelled like sunshine and shadows and moonlight and earth and flowers and beeswax and grass. Servants crept carefully through the rooms with brooms and ladders, sweeping up fallen leaves and petals and positioning candles inside crystal. So you can see the disposition that she uses in the outside, the inside, hope and regret. Next slide. So here we are, the last ones here. We're gonna compare Regency Romances London and then Mystery's Big Bad City, which of course sometimes can be the same place. All right, so the reading I'm gonna do here is from Courtney Milan's book, The Heiress Effect, which is a comedy of ill manners. So this book is hilarious if any of you have read it. Uh, it has themes of knowing your place. And this is actually the book that made me want to write historical romance. So London here is more than just the collection of buildings, but also the society and the rules that existed. The heiress effect was really good at explaining expectations and thwarting them. And the portrait here is of Beau Brummel. He was the quintessential Regency era gentleman. So you can imagine what disdain might look like coming from a man like him. There was a frozen silence that Oliver associated with those moments of upper class awkwardness. It was a moment when every man around made a calculation based on manners and decided to hold his thought to himself rather than speak aloud and risk rudeness. For all that it was supposedly born of manners, that silence could be cut. I'm gonna hand out there. All right, um, to the big bad city in mysteries. So I'm drawn to fiction set in urban locales. There's just more energy, more people, more contrast, more everything, and that really satisfies me. So New Orleans and the Gilded Age is definitely one big bad city. It's still a big bad city about 20 years later when David Filmer sets his New Orleans crime fiction series. And his is about a professional Creole detective and who intersects between uh, the jazz musicians and prostitutes alike. So this is from uh, David Filmer's The Iron Angel. Cribs of unpainted clabbered line both, street, both sides of the streets like horse stalls with barely enough room for a bed with a dirty mattress and a washstand. The hovels rented for a dollar a day and women charged a quarter for the pleasure they could offer. The only sounds were cat calls, curses, the breaking of glass, and the occasional screech of rusty hinges or dry bed springs. Faint music drifted from a saloon a block over on Valaire, where a small dance band played for the drunkards and their hussies. Ah, what a sad, bad city. But well drawn, you know where you are. So uh, just a couple more uh, readings. So I also wanted to um, to let you know that, that settings that transport are not important just for historical fiction, but also for historical nonfiction, aka straight history. So I wanted to read you something from John Barry's The Great Influenza, a history of the uh, 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic. And this is actually from chapter six, although um, which actually starts where he starts talking about the actual virus. And it's interesting that his first five chapters are all about people. They're about the warriors who are going to fight the virus. But here's where the virus first appeared. In Haskell County, Kansas, lies west of Dodge City, where cattle drives up from Texas reached a railhead and belongs geographically to, and in 1918, not far in time from, the truly wild west. The landscape was and is flat and treeless, and the county literally of the earth. Here land, crops, and livestock were everything, and the smell of manure meant civilization. Farmers lived in close proximity to hogs and fowl with cattle, pigs, and poultry everywhere. There were plenty of dogs, too, and owners made sure to teach their dogs not to chase someone else's cattle. That could get them shot. And this is the environment where um, the virus that started the Spanish influenza first appeared. Okay, I, I think it's a beautiful setting. I think it's well done, but it's kind of grim. So let's go on and, and do one more reading and uh, let's move out of Kansas and let's go to Paris. Uh, this setting is from uh, historian David McCullough, 1830. 
It was not just that they had never known a city of such size or variety or with so much history, but they had never known one where the look and feel could be so strikingly different in different light. The Seine could be any of a dozen shades of mud brown or chalky green, gleaming silver or a deep indigo, depending on the time of year, the time of day, and simply whether the sun was out. The change could be astonishing, theatrical. In the gloom of winter, sand-colored bridges and palaces could even look as leaden as the skies overhead, just as in full sunshine. Even in winter, the same bridges and palaces would glow with such golden warmth, it was as if they were lit from within. Ooh, don't you want to be there? <laughs> this, this is a great setting. All right, so this concludes our reading portion of the event. Next, we move on to CB. All right, and here is a slide that shows all the books that we did our readings from, in case any of them were of interest to you. You can take a quick look at that. And then we're going to go on, and we have some recommendations from us of other wonderful historical novels to read. And from EDK, she recommends uh, My Lady Governess, a delightful, unexpected, hilarious romance set in the English countryside. Also, The Stationery Shop, an intriguing romance set in pre coup Tehran in the 1950s. And The Black Count, which is actually a nonfiction biography of Alexander Dumas's father during revolutionary France. Anna Brazos recommends Veil of Lies, which is a story of a former knight who makes a new life for himself, tracking down lost objects and uncovering hidden secrets in 1384 London. Mr. Churchill's Secretary is a series of novels set during World War II and follows a female spy with a different setting in each book. And then The Anatomist's Wife, is another mystery series that is set in the 1830s, Scotland and England. My recommendations are Pinmaric, which is an older book that's set in Cornwall during the late 19th century and up until World War II. And it follows an aristocratic family as the world changes around them forever. And it was later made into a BBC miniseries. Um, if you haven't read the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society, um, it's a heartwarming and eye-opening tale of life on the Channel Islands under the rule of the Nazis. The Stolen Crown is set during the 15th century Wars of the Roses, a story that about that turbulent time, and it's told through the eyes of the sister of Elizabeth Woodville, and Elizabeth Woodville is the queen of Edward IV. And now just to give you just a quick overview of our own books, we have A Lady's Revenge, where an Earl's daughter takes up the sweet science of boxing to protect herself and exact revenge in the award-winning start of EDK's Feminist Pugilist Regency Romance series. The Boxer and the Blacksmith is the second in the series and can be read as a standalone and it is going to be available on February 1st, 2021. And Anna Brazel's award-winning Fanny Newcomb and the Irish Channel Ripper in Gilded Age New Orleans is terrorized by a Jack the Ripper copycat. Can amateur detective Fanny Newcomb stopped the Irish Channel Ripper before he murders again. And I can tell you, I've read all three of these books and they're all really great. I really enjoyed all of them. And the last one is My Work in Progress. It's a family saga that's set against the backdrop of the War of the Roses. That's where Roses comes from. And it's about a people that they are seeking to free themselves of a tyrannical regime, hence the rebels. And I hope to have a publication date for that next year. So I'm getting close to having that done. So I'm looking forward to that. 
All right, and we want to thank everyone for coming. So if you have any questions or you have your own book recommendations, we'd love to hear them. If you want to find out more about us, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Paper Lantern Writers. And we also have a fantastic blog where we blog a couple times a week about a lot of different subjects, and that's another great place to find us. I saw earlier that there was a question about how to do uh, location chats or location um, research during the time of COVID. So I will say that I was researching heavily into a, well, a bar really. Um, and, <laughs> Cause that's what you know. Um, and I needed to find a, something, a tavern that would be a good place for a meetup that would occur and that would, uh, be prominent in my third book, which I'm working on right now. Um, and so what I did is I actually went to Google and I went to the street view and walked around the street to see if the outside looked okay. It has this really funky little alleyway next to it, which was perfect. And so that's how I ended up trying to solve that problem. Yeah. Oh, so Rebecca is asking about um, Sanborn maps, and I wish they had them for other time periods also. I've heard, I've heard that they do have them um, for London and for Great Britain about the same period, and I, I haven't seen them, and I don't know who made them, but if they had them for Great Britain, they might have them for other countries also. But um, in America, it was right after the Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm available for hire. <laughs> We'd like to hire you. Um, so we do have a giveaway to um, figure out. So if anybody needs to throw in a new comment, I have six entries right now for mine. I have three entries for Anna. So if you want to pop into the comments and say a few more, just to make sure that you get entered into a free book. Because that's what you need right now is a free book. And mine is a paperback. Yeah, mine's just an ebook. <laughs> but you get it right away. You get two of them? One. Uh, I'm just going to do the A Lady's Revenge. Uh, see if you like it. Oh, yeah. Most of the books, uh, Heather C's comment there that were social histories. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Oh, well, we're going through a rough time right now. I can say that. Rough then, rough now. So um, I am going to, uh, all right, so the winner for mine is Anissa Joy Armstrong. I guess we will get your information offline. And uh, so congratulations. You are getting a, a uh, ebook coming your way, drop into your Kindle or Nook or whatever device you have. And for Anna's, Elizabeth Mitchell. We know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you guys can figure out information afterwards. Um, do we have any more questions? This is a really lovely thing to do. And I'm very excited and happy that everybody came and participated. This was big fun. Yeah. Thanks for inviting us all the way from the Bay Area. <laughs> <laughs> well, North, North Cal. So uh, winners, if you want to just send your email addresses to admin at paperlanternwriters.com. That is our Paper Lantern Writers. And we can send out the information from there. That's a nice place to just funnel our information through. All right, any other questions? All right, so I guess next up uh, is the bridge between AuthorTube and the literary world. So with Margaret Pernard and JD Estrada. So thank you guys for tuning in, really appreciate it. This was a great opportunity. Um, and thank you to Margaret and Al, this is wonderful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you.